Well, here we are, the uh, book of Genesis, the foundation book of the Bible. And if you're following along in your Bibles and uh, uh, those who are watching this on uh, DVD, if you're following along with your own Bible, then open them to chapter two, verse 21. This is the 13th lesson in this uh, particular series. And for those of you in the class, of course, I'll be throwing up the, uh, the scripture references uh, on the monitor. Well, in our last lesson, um, uh, we uh, had the more details concerning the creation of man. I, wanna, I always like to kind of review a little bit, get us back into the picture of what we are uh, discussing because there's so much material. Um, first of all, we said that God initiate, or in Genesis we see that God initiates man's ability to use his intelligence in relating to God through moral choices. Uh, the idea is that in choosing right from wrong, man demonstrates several things. First of all, his superiority over animals. Animals don't have a sense of morality. But man does, man has a sense of something that he ought to do or ought not to do. It's naturally wired into him. Secondly, we see his ability to perceive and relate to a higher being. Uh, you know, if there weren't a higher being, why would this, you know, why would all people, no matter where they are, feel a need to relate to higher, a higher being? So God has created him in that way with that particular ability and also his freedom to affect his own destiny. In other words, uh, God creates man in such a way that man can choose um, uh, what his destiny will be. He can choose to obey God and live with God and have the life that God promises that goes with that choice, or he can reject and uh, suffer the uh, consequences of that. Also, we see that God instructs man concerning his environment especially the animal kingdom. You know, he, it, you know, in the Bible, very, very succinct. You know, there's not a lot of long drawn out uh, descriptions. It merely says that uh, uh, Adam was naming the animals uh, and the sense there, the word, that word naming, meaning he names them according to knowledge. He knows who, what they are, what they do, how they fit in uh, to uh, the uh, creation. And so we see that particular activity taking place. And then God leads man to the knowledge of his aloneness and need for fellowship with a like being. Um, he sees that this is not possible through his rulership over the creation. You know, he rules over the creation and he senses, he sees that he is above the animals, but within the animals, among the animals, he doesn't see any uh, creature uh, with whom he can have a relationship with. And in coming to that conclusion, he also comes to the knowledge of his aloneness. And so this prepares man for God's final act of creation, which is the creation of woman. So the creation of woman begins in uh, chapter uh, two. Uh, verse 21 and 22, so let's read those verses. It says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Now, you know, throughout history and uh, especially in the modern age, uh, we've, we've seen this idea, you know, Adam's rib, this idea come out in all kinds of contexts. People make jokes about it and so on and so forth, but this is a very serious uh, event that takes place. And I want, uh, I want you to see some of the things uh, to note carefully regarding the creation of woman in this uh, short uh, couple of verses, these short couple of verses that uh, describe that. First of all, the sleep of Adam and the new life that eventually proceeded after his sleep was actually uh, also has a kind of a metaphysical or a, a, a spiritual con uh, idea, if you wish. Um, it, is the, um, uh, it is the first prefigurement 
of the death and the resurrection of Jesus as well as a prefigurement of the death and resurrection of man as a new creature. Because Adam goes into a deep sleep and then he awakes. And when he awakens, things have changed. You know, a new, uh, uh, he himself becomes different because he'll be joined to woman. So that's kind of a preview, you know, prefigurement. It's like a preview of what will come much further uh, in the future. Um, the prefigurement of Christ's death and resurrection and the prefigurement of Adam or mankind's death and ultimate resurrection. And it's also a wonderful metaphor for the marriage, or for marriage rather, where one dies to self in order to create a new identity of the couple in marriage. Another interesting thing to note about this passage is that the word rib, uh, you know, it says he took a rib from Adam. The word rib is not the most accurate of translations uh, into English. And uh, the reason for that, it, it, it fails to convey fully the idea um, um, that God uh, is accomplishing in this, uh, in this action. You know, we think of a rib, we just, you know, we think of a rib, just a bone, you know. A more accurate word is a side. And translated side, 25, or 20 rather, of the 35 times that it's used in the Old Testament. So the point is that God removed not just a bone, but He removed a part of man's side that included both the bone and the flesh, as well as the blood. So the idea is that God did not remove you know, from the head or from the feet uh, to uh, signify superiority or inferiority, but He took from the side which signified equality. And He did so to provide a help, uh, someone to assist. Um, she was woman, that is, was to aid Adam to eliminate his loneliness. Last week I told you that um, help meet, it's not a help meet, but it's a help meet for Adam. And the idea here is that she helps, she, that word means to surround, to assist, to save. And so she was created to assist and to save Adam from his loneliness. And of course, his own, her own loneliness. Um, also, she would assist him in managing the garden and the greater creation given to man by God. All right, another interesting thing I want to look at uh, uh, concerning this passage is that God could have formed her from the ground, but He didn't. I mean, He could have formed her you know, from the dirt, uh, and He chose not to. He chose to form her from the side of Adam uh, in order uh, for her to be able to share the nature of man. However, her likeliness to God was given to her by God. She wasn't taught to be like God by man. You know, it says, so God created man in his own image, and then he says, male and female created he him. Genesis, go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So, so woman's spiritual character, spiritual image is there because God has created her in this way. Her form, her essence, her function, her psyche, God created all these things. So God knows women because He created them uh, in, the way that they, in the way that they are. A woman might be a mystery to man many times, but she's never a mystery to God. Another interesting point on these two verses is that God brought woman to man. His original design is for woman, one woman, to be with one man. And you know, the old joke, it's, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Uh, one man, one woman. Uh, this is the original design. So if someone says to you, you know, where is it in the Bible that says you know, that two men can't be married, or two women can't be married, or three men and one woman, or five women and one, where does it say that? Well, it says it right at the very beginning. And it's significant that it says it right at the beginning because right at the beginning is the essential imagery, the, the, essen the essential formation of human beings and human beings 
uh, in the basic relationship of marriage. One man, one woman. So uh, it's significant. Uh, if God would have wanted, if God designed us to live in some other kind of construct, some other kind of uh, um, uh, uh, organization, if you will, this would have been the time to set that in motion. But we see as we read throughout the Bible that you know, the disintegration of, uh, of, of, of society through sin, in the disintegration, uh, disintegration of society through sin, we see that men and women go away from this model. So going away from this model of one man and one woman is always portrayed in the Bible as sinful or as, uh, as a failure or as a disintegration uh, or a, 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 you know, a, a devolution, if you wish, of the original, uh, the original model. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the family. So he's created one man, one woman. We're going to talk about the family in the next couple of verses here. So the first social unit creation, um, created rather, not evolved, but created, is the family. It's such a basic inherent unit that in any society, at any point in history, when the family unit disintegrates, so does that society. And that's the great danger in American society. You know, I, I don't want to get into politics here, but the great danger in our society is that as the family disintegrates, as the family is fractured, so is the society. You know, the Roman Empire ruled for a lot longer than the United States. You know, the United States is a, is a superpower uh, you know, uh, still to this day. But it hasn't been a superpower for like a century. You know? uh, Rome was you know, ruler of the world for centuries. And yet it caved in because of divorce and sexual perversion. Uh, these things became rampant to weaken the empire from within so that it became vulnerable from without. Now what evolves from the family unit are social structures like tribes, and nations and governments. Uh, e even the church is modeled after the family and much of the imagery of the family is used in the Bible to describe the church. You know, we call the church, among other things, the bride of Christ. And, and Christians within the church, we call each other uh, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and so there's the imagery of the family used to describe the church. So in the following verses in Genesis chapter two, the structure and the attitude um, that create and sustain healthy families are put forth. So let's read verse 23. It says, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, when Adam named the animals, he knew from observation that they were alive, but they were not like himself because of their form and because of their limitations. They couldn't talk, for example. When God brings Eve to Adam, he recognizes that although her form is different, she is similar to him in nature and she is, even more importantly, suitable for fellowship, for intimacy, something that the animals were not capable of. And so Adam acknowledges not only that she is human, but in doing so, acknowledges her status alongside of himself as one who is in the image of God. So he knows he's in the image of God and now he recognizes that Eve is also, this woman that God brings him, she also is in the image of God. And so just as he named the animals, described where they fit into the scheme of things, he now also names the one brought to him by God and he calls her woman. Now in the Hebrew, the Hebrew for man is ish and the Hebrew for woman is isha. And so woman is not a separate identity, but she derives her identity from man because she was formed from man and not separate materials. God did not form woman from the earth, from the you know, other elements of the, of the earth. He formed her from man. That's why she 
shares in his form and, and, and so on and so forth. And God did not create her from nothing. He made her from man. That's why men and women, you know, they fit together so well physically and emotionally and spiritually because God intended that. Different but the same in their spiritual and physical and emotional nature. And then we go on to verse 24, it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now in one verse, um, a summary of the elements of what a family is, how it is formed, and how to guarantee its health. It's amazing, you know? again, the Bible is so compact in giving so much information uh, in so, you know, so few sentences. So let's look at Genesis 2.24. Let's take a look at some of the things that it says. First of all, it talks about the basic family. A family is made up of a man and a woman and their children. Now there are variations of this today. You know, on TV, uh, two dads and one child, or single parents. We see single parents for a variety of reasons uh, today in our society. Or we see children raising other children. Or uh, uh, couples who uh, have no interest in children. Uh, or groups that are living together, you know, uh, sharing the child raising, child rearing um, uh, responsibilities and having various you know, relationships with each other in the group. So there's all kinds of you know, formats, all kinds of uh, ways to uh, put together a quote family. Uh, and I'm not saying that these others can't develop family characteristics and they can't share the warmth of family, but we have to remember that the original and ideal combination is a man and a woman and their children. And again, as I say, there are a lot of reasons why this can't happen. Uh, someone passes away, there's a divorce, a child dies, you know, we blend two families together. Of course, you know, things happen in life. Uh, what we're saying simply is that according to the Bible, it at least articulates for us what the ideal is. So you know, we know what we're shooting for here. Secondly, we see that families are formed when children leave existing families and form new families through marriage. And when this happens, a new family unit is formed and the dynamics begin to change. You know, the loyalty of the children change to include their spouse as the priority relationship. You know, and parents, of course, need to be able to let go. You know, that's why it says a man leaves his mother and father cleaves to his wife. You know, there are more problems in marriages caused by children who put their parents ahead of their partners. And conversely, parents who refuse to recognize the new roles that their children play in their marriages. You know, the male child leaves home, takes on a wife. He is now the head of that family. Not, not, the, not his dad, his dad is not the head of that family. His dad is the head of his family and the son is the head of his family and that needs to be recognized and supported. In the same way, the female child has a new priority you know, and the in-laws need to recognize that. All right, another idea that comes out of this is that in order for the marriage to work, it needs these you know, it needs basic ingredients, a couple of them anyways, that are alluded to in this passage. First of all, it needs intimacy. You know, the husband cleaves to his wife. The term cleave in the old, you know, in, in, the, in the old versions there, was a term that meant to be glued to or to hang on to uh, one's wife. And the point is that marriage must produce a closeness between the couple that is not available in any other relationship and in any other situation. You can have a best friend and you can have a uh, you know, hunting buddy or you can have a, you know, girl talk, shopping, so that's all good, that's all, you know, that's all wonderful, part of life. But in the end, it's your marriage, it's your partner in marriage 
Uh, it's with that person that you will cultivate the greatest intimacy. In a practical sense, this means that we are closer to our partners, we cherish our partners more than any other person, any other activity, any other pursuit. Because marriage is a commitment to make the other person the priority over whatever else was our priority before we were married. You know, a single woman leaves, uh, lives with her widowed mother and they live together for a long time and then the, the single uh, woman uh, finds a mate and gets married. The priority is her husband. He becomes the priority, even though she has strong ties with her mother. Her husband becomes the priority. And if that doesn't happen, that marriage is undermined. And you know what, it works the other way too. You know, the mom and the, take the same scenario, the mom, the widowed mom and the daughter live together, so and so, oh, and mom now finds a partner and, and, and she marries in the same way. Her, her, her husband now becomes the priority. It doesn't mean that she rejects her child or her daughter, of course not, but her priority is her new husband. Otherwise, that marriage uh, will be seriously uh, undermined. I mean, just look at successful marriages. You know, just look around you. Where people are not just together, but where they are thankful and they're happy being together. They'd rather be together than, than be apart. And what do you see? You'll see that the difference in their marriage is that their partners are their number one priority. Not work, not hobbies, not best friends not the internet and, and all that goes on in the internet. And then another thing that is required is exclusivity. They will be one flesh. One flesh includes the idea of exclusive, faithful, sexual partners, but it goes, on, it goes beyond this, not just it. it. Includes that, but more than that. They are bonded together physically and emotionally, spiritually and socially. Couples you know, are, are sometimes united legally and sexually, but they're not bonded together in any other way. You know, they don't share the same religion, they don't share money. I mean, you know, the attitude about money, there's his money, there's her money. You know? uh, they don't share dreams. They don't share dreams and hopes. Uh, they don't share activities. He has his things that he does with his people. She has things that she does with her people. And the most that they do is they come back and they kind of report to each other what they did. This may work for a while, but it doesn't build the relationship. Relationship building requires that they share activities as well. Nothing new, I'm not saying anything new to you. I'm simply saying that the Bible uh, you know, assumes this idea, and again, in a few words, they become one flesh. And that idea, I'm simply kind of parsing it out for you and how that works, how that works out in, uh, every day, in an everyday relationship. Also, successful marriages, uh, you know, they have uh, intimacy, they have exclusivity, and they also have longevity. And longevity is you know, what the Bible here again points to in that verse. It's not specified, but the intention of God with the family is that it is to be a permanent unit. This is uh, the ideal established uh, in the garden, and it is this ideal that Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter nine, you know, 19, eight. you know, Jesus is saying whatever God puts together, man you know, should not. Uh, tear apart, take apart. He didn't say you can't do it, didn't, didn't say that doesn't happen. He's saying it shouldn't happen. When it happens, it's, it's wrong. Throughout history, you know, God has made provision for man's failure in this area, as well as forgiveness and restoration through the gospel. God understands that we don't always live up to that ideal, and He makes provisions for that through His mercy and through His grace, but the original ideal and pattern for what a marriage is and ought to be has never changed. It's always a man and a woman. It's always they are bonded together in one flesh. It's always and they're going to be together for life. The commitment is for life. Do we always succeed at that? No. 
but at least let's recognize that that's the ideal. I tell that to people who are going into you know, subsequent marriages, in other words, this is the second time they're getting married for whatever reason. I always hold up to them the ideal. Just because you may not have succeeded in the first attempt, just because your spouse passed away or left you or whatever, you know, it doesn't mean that the ideal has changed. Your situation has changed, but the ideal hasn't changed. The ideal is always the same. All right, finally, let's close out the chapter. Let's take a look at a glimpse into the first relationship before sin and death entered the world. So uh, in the previous verses, we're talking about the ideal, what marriage should be in the last verse. It kind of reverts its focus back to Adam and Eve. And it says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So now you know, the focus of the writing uh, goes back to look at Adam and Eve and their relationship. And what does it say? Well, first it says they were both naked because the weather you know, obviously did not require clothing and the law did not require uh, clothing as well and their consciences did not require them to wear clothing either. They were uh, without shame. Um, uh, secondly, it refers to them now as the man and his wife, not just Adam and the woman, now it says the man and his wife, and the question is, there is an acknowledgement here of marriage and family. But some people say, well, how did they marry? Well, there are three steps in any marriage, and Adam is no different. First of all, there's knowledge. So man recognizes woman as one who is like him. He knows this. He honors her. He accepts her place alongside of himself and her role in the scheme of things. So there's knowledge. The first step is knowledge. He knows who Eve is. Well, in the same way today, you know, that's the first step, isn't it? Knowledge. We do it differently. God just doesn't bring some woman to us and introduce us, but we do find a partner, right? A potential one. And how do we get to know them? Knowledge. Well, there's courtship and dating and we get engaged and so on and so forth, right? variations of these type of things in every society. You meet someone and then you begin to get to know them and you begin to find out about them and your affection for them begins to grow and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's the first step. Well, th this is the first step in the garden as well. Adam began to know Eve. Second step is the covenant. Man acknowledges her before a witness. She is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You know, he acknowledges who she is and there was only one witness and who's the witness? Well, God is the witness and the angels, I guess. He acknowledges that she belongs to him. She is bone of my bone. You know, she belongs to me and I belong to her. That's the covenant. Well, fast forward to today. What is the covenant? We acknowledge that that person is going to be uh, partnered with us in, in marriage and we with them. We have, the, of course, today the marriage ceremony and the white dress and the tuxedos, but those are just you know, Western traditions. You don't think that a thousand years ago uh, men wore tuxedos, right? This is, these, are, these are just you know, European traditions that kind of came down to us generation uh, generation after generation. But the concept is the same. You know, we uh, have a covenant moment with our partner uh, in the same way that, that Adam had a covenant moment with Eve, accepting her as the partner that God gave her before a witness. We do the same thing before a witness. As a matter of fact, we have two witnesses, right? And, and usually there's the clergyman, the preacher, the minister, the, the priest, the rabbi, whatever. It's the same idea. And we, we do it in a legal way. You know, we, we take a vow in a legal way. We enter into a contract. Well, here in Adam and Eve, they enter into a commitment together. They belong together. They recognize that they do. They acknowledge this publicly before God. 
And then the third step is the confirmation. They, conf they confirm their unity through sexual intimacy. And isn't that what we do today as well? Uh, once the covenant is made and signed, don't the couple go off and they live together, they, go to, you know, they usually go off on a honeymoon or something like that, but after the covenant comes the confirmation, comes the, comes the intimacy. So every ancient and modern society recognizes and practices in some way the principle of monogamous marriage and family. And I'll tell you something, you know, these three steps, knowledge, covenant, confirmation, when we get these three steps out of whack, when we put three instead of two and, and put two at the bottom or one at the bottom and three at the top, and in our society, if you, if you look at you know, uh, Hollywood, if you look at you know, the, the, the images and the, the messages that we get through our entertainment, usually it's the other way around, right? I mean, there's hardly any knowledge of the individual. They meet on a date and two days later, you know, uh, there's a scene where everybody's ripping their clothes off. You know. In other words, they put the confirmation first and then they put knowledge second and then they put covenant third. We sleep together, then we live together, get to know each other, and then we get married. And the problem is when you survey people who have done this, uh, the divorce rate is much, much higher. The opportunity, well I won't call it an opportunity, but the chance for failure of that relationship um, grows uh, exponentially as they get this order here out of whack. So it was the order in the garden, knowledge, covenant, confirmation, intimacy, and it should be the order today. We get to know someone and then we make a, a commitment to them based on that knowledge. I, I tell young people, they say, well, how will you get to know someone if you don't sleep with them? And I tell them, if you sleep with them before you get to know them, you probably will have a much harder time getting to know them because that sexual intimacy gets in the way all the time. Okay? So there are a lot of ways to get to know someone and to get to know them quite deeply without sexual uh, intimacy. At least enough knowledge about that person to bring you to the next step, which would be the covenant. Uh, you know, this was the way things were done for many, many, many centuries before we got to our modern society and marriages had a much longer uh, longevity, if you wish, uh, longevity rate than they, than they do today. But of course, many people think that uh, they know better and uh, they know better than God's, than God's way. So as I said, every, every ancient and modern society recognizes and practices in some form or another the principle of monogamous marriage and family. Uh, there are some polygamous societies, but these are always aberrations and they don't usually survive. And then it says at the very end, you know, they were not ashamed. There was no sin. The reason they were not ashamed is that there was no knowledge of evil in any form to cause guilt or shame, especially evil connected with personal sin. There was none of that, so there was no shame. Their nakedness was natural and it was a symbol of their open and transparent and trusting relationship. You know, in a marriage here, I don't want to get too detailed, but in a marriage after a certain amount of time, we become comfortable with one another in various stages of you know, undress. You know, uh, while you're taking a shower, you're waiting for her to come out of the shower, so on and so forth. You know, we, we're comfortable with each other, right? In, in you know, being naked, but it takes time to get to that point. And why do we get to that point? Well, we get to that point because at some point we trust our partner, you know, we've been intimate with our partner, so on and so forth. Well, Adam and Eve, you know, they were not ashamed because they had that trust and that openness and so on and so forth right off the bat, right at the beginning, because there was no sin. Okay, so there's a, some insights, if you wish, from the verses that describe the, um, the creation of Eve 
and then subsequently uh, the uh, marriage and family relationship. So next week we're going to get into a whole new topic now and that is the, or next time we get together, uh, that is the, uh, the temptation and the fall. So I thank you for uh, being with us in this class and uh, those of you who watch this uh, uh, lesson on DVD or online, please know that you can download uh, the notes that the students in the class are uh, using um, during the class, just go to BibleTalk.tv, uh, go to the Genesis um, class or Genesis uh, book and uh, you'll have an opportunity to download the notes. That's it. Thank you very much.